Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Angela Greiling Keen. I'm a reporter for Bloomberg News and the 106th president of the National Press Club. We are the world's leading professional organization for journalists, committed to our profession's future through our programming with events such as this, while fostering a free press worldwide. For more information about the National Press Club, please visit our website at www.press.org. To donate to programs offered to the public through the National Press Club Journalism Institute, please visit press.org backslash institute. On behalf of our members worldwide, I'd like to welcome our speaker and those of you in our audience today. If you hear applause, I'd note that members of the general public are also attending, so it's not necessarily evidence of a lack of journalistic objectivity. I'd also like to welcome our C-SPAN and public radio audiences. You can follow the action today on Twitter using the hashtag NPCLunch. After our guest speech concludes, we'll have a question and answer session. I will ask as many questions as time permits. Now, I'd like to introduce our head table guests. From your right, His Excellency Luis Car Carlos Villegas, Ambassador for the Republic of Colombia. Her Excellency Maria Angela Holguin, Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Republic of Colombia. Skipping over the podium, Allison Fitzgerald, Finance and Investigative Reporter at the Center for Public Integrity and Chairwoman of the National Press Club Speakers Committee. Skipping over our speaker for just a moment, Myron Balkind, Vice President of the National Press Club, former Associated Press Correspondent, currently Professor at George Washington University, and the National Press Club member who organized today's event. Thank you, Myron. Our guest today could well have been a member of the National Press Club if he were not the President of Colombia. As a journalist, President Juan Manuel Santos was a columnist and deputy director of the newspaper El Tiempo and was president of the Freedom of Expression Commission for the Inter-American Press Association. He has also published several books, including The Third Way, co-written with former British Prime Minister Tony Blair and Check on Terror, where he describes the most important actions against the FARC rebel group during his tenure as head of the Ministry of Defense. Journalist Santos ultimately entered politics. Perhaps he will tell us all why he made that career change and rose to become president of Colombia in 2010. He was elected for a four-year term extending until August 2014, obtaining more than 9 million votes, the highest amount obtained by any candidate in the history of Colombian democracy. Two weeks ago, he announced he will run for re-election in next year's presidential election saying he wants to be able to finish the peace process he started. President Santos campaigned in 2010 on a platform to carry on the offensive against the leftist guerrillas that have waged war against the government for decades. As president, however, he opened talks with the main rebel group, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, or FARC. Negotiators reached a draft agreement on November 6th on one aspect of the talks, and we expect President Santos will tell us today about the negotiations and the chances for an ultimate peace agreement. The peace negotiations could well be a central issue in next year's presidential elections, with one leading opponent calling for an end to the peace talks. Also opposing the peace negotiations is former President Alvaro Oribe, also a former National Press Club speaker, who says he favors someone who as president will take a harder stance against the rebels. Please help me give a warm National Press Club welcome to Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for attending uh, this uh, session. For me, it's a great pleasure to be here among my fellow journalists. Um, why did I switch from journalism to uh, politics? Uh, I still ask that question myself. <laughs> I, I, was, I was seeing uh, the, the, uh, the letterhead of, of one of the rooms, the First Amendment uh, launch, and I, I remember reading 
about Thomas Jefferson when he said he was uh, struggling for the First Amendment and, says, and he said there can be no good government without absolute freedom of expression in the press. And after he was president, he said there cannot be a good government with complete freedom of expression in the press. I don't know. <laughs> I will tell you at the end of my, uh, of my government if that is true or not. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for, for being here. I will try to summarize uh, what I've been doing in Washington or in the US, uh, give you some uh, basic messages, and then open it up for questions. Um, I've been here two days, yesterday in Miami, and went to the University of Miami, and then had a meeting with my uh, Col the Colombian community in Miami, and this morning I went to a meeting with the Inter-American Inter Dialogue, breakfast there. I was a member of the Inter-American Dialogue for many years. I was co-vice chairman. Then I had a very interesting and fruitful visit to, to the White House with President Obama. I'm here as his guest on an official visit. Uh, then I went to the OAS, spoke to the uh, General Assembly of the OAS or the uh, ambassadors and other uh, guests that they had invited. I then uh, went to speak with uh, uh, the um, head of the Democratic Party in the House, uh, Nancy Pelosi, and a few of the members of the House of the Democratic uh, uh, Party. Then I went to, to speak with Speaker Boehner and a few of the Republicans in the House, uh, with whom I've been working for many years not only as president, but also as a former minister, and now I am here. Um, last night I had a m dinner with uh, the Center for American Progress, the members of that uh, think tank, um, and I'm having dinner tonight with uh, the Atlantic Council. That inv they invited me to address them. What has been what have been the, the main messages I've tried to convey to the U.S. officials and to the U.S. public? Um, first, uh, uh, thank the, the U.S. government and both uh, parties for the help that they have given us uh, since we started collaborating through Plan Colombia. I was telling uh, uh, Donna Salada yesterday, the president of the University of Miami, listen, see how things have changed in these 13 years, because that was in the year 2000. Before any president who came to Miami uh, went to the Southcom. This time I come to Miami and I go to a university. That in a way describes how things have changed in my country and in our relations. And uh, we have been trying to make uh, an effort to go beyond the security uh, challenge, which we have fortunately made tremendous progress there, but Colombia needs much more than security. And that's why I took the decision when I won the election also to work uh, in other fronts besides the security and open the agenda with the world also to other and matters besides security. That does not mean that we have neglected security. We have continued to advance in terms of security. And in these three years, we have given the worst demolishing blows to the FARC, to the ELN. We took down the number one, the number two, 47 of their leaders, the number in, in arms of people in arms uh, of these organizations are at their lowest in history since we take some kind of counting of, the, of their members. Uh, but I also decided to open uh, a peace process with them simply because every war has to end through some kind of negotiation. And uh, I thought the conditions were correct the conditions were present, 
and I took the decision to open these negotiations, uh, very conscious of the fact that it would be more complex, would be difficult, uh, that it would have enemies, but uh, also very conscious that this was the correct step and the correct objective. Making war is uh, more popular and easier than making peace. And I can tell you, because I've been in both sides, as Minister of Defense and now as President, uh, we have advanced in the peace process uh, much more than any other moment in our history in many attempts that we have made to have peace after 50 years of war. Uh, we managed to negotiate uh, first the agenda. That is a major step in any uh, uh, process to end the conflict. If you agree on the agenda, you, you have agreed of 50 percent of, of what you need. And we did that a bit more than a year ago. Uh, and uh, we negotiated five, five points in the agenda. And we have agreed two of those five points. The first point has been an agreement on what to do with our rural areas, our rural development. Uh, this is extremely important because the guerrillas are uh, a, a ruler guerrilla. They, they were born there. They, were, uh, they grew there. And so for them, this issue was very important. And we already have an agreement on, on that point. The second very important point is uh, political participation. How are they going to participate in politics, uh, the transition from bullets to votes, from arms to arguments? Um, what are, how is it that we're going to open the, the, the space for them? And this point is, is something that the Colombian democracy needed anyway. Uh, progress in strengthening our democracy, strengthening the participation of the people in our democratic process. So we have reached agreement on those two points. We are at this very moment negotiating a third item, which is drug trafficking. This is an item that I put on the agenda deliberately uh, with one very simple reason. They have always said that they're not drug traffickers, that they profit from drug trafficking, but they're not drug traffickers. If that is so, I've told them, if that is so, then, and if you want to become legal, you have to become allies of the state against drug trafficking. And if we succeed in, uh, in the objective, which has already ag agreed between the two parts, uh, Colombia without coca, without cocaine, um, just think what that would mean, not only to Colombia, but to the whole region or the US. Colombia has been the major provider of cocaine to the world and to the U.S. for 40 years. Uh, can you imagine what this would mean if there is a change internally that suddenly disrupts the flow of cocaine uh, to the American cities or to the region? It would be a major breakthrough. And that in itself is an extremely important uh, point uh, besides the, the other points of having peace in our country. So I have uh, thanked uh, both President uh, Obama and uh, all the authorities that have been supporting this peace process. The peace process needs support. There are enemies who don't want uh, the process to have a good ending uh, for various reasons. Some people think that we are legitimizing the FARC. Uh, my answer is, if you don't sit down and speak with your enemy, then how are you going to reach peace? If they think that we can kill the last of the guerrilla, we would take another 50 years in order to, to do that. Uh, so the way to end a conflict of this sort is by sitting down and negotiating 
a final agreement, and that's what we're trying to do. Um, some people are saying that we are giving in to the FARC or that we are uh, giving in to the Castro or the Chavez regime. Uh, this is nonsense. This is absolute nonsense. We have uh, sought the we sought the help from Venezuela and Cuba precisely because they have influence in the FARC, and they have been helpful. And uh, I thank them for their help. But what we want is a, a very simple objective, all of us, to have peace in my country. We're not negotiating our economic model. We're not negotiating our political institutions. We're not negotiating our democratic principles. We are simply negotiating a transition of these people from their violence and their uh, pursuit of power through violent means to uh, their pursuit of power through democratic and legal means. That's it. That's how what we're negotiating. And uh, today, if you ask me uh, how optimistic I am, I continue to say I'm cautiously optimistic. This is a very complex process, uh, 50 years of war, you don't uh, resolve in 50 weeks of conversations. Um, and, uh, but I am today more optimistic than I was a year ago. I think we are moving in the right direction. I am finding political will in the other side of the table. And uh, I think that if we continue uh, with the progress that we've been making, we will find, find uh, an agreement which will change the history, not only of Colombia, but of the whole region. Simultaneously, when I took over uh, the presidency, I said, we need to uh, build the conditions for peace, because peace is not made only by laying down the arms of the guerrillas. Peace is, is made in the house, in the schools, in the social investment. So I decided to make a very progressive uh, reforms. And I, I followed an example of a great uh, former American president, Abraham Lincoln. And I, I uh, invited my former rivals in the campaign to become part of the member of, of, of the government. We have here one of them, the head of the Liberal Party, very important the party. He is now a Labour Minister, part of the government. And we created a national unity that has allowed us to approve reforms that nobody imagined possible uh, four or five years ago in Colombia. For decades had been thought, but that they they seemed impossible. With this national union, we have been able to approve those reforms that are giving us uh, the, the instruments to have a very strong economy and so especially, for me, more important, very good social results. And the facts are there. Uh, the economy is growing almost at the average of 5%. Um, we have been creating jobs for 40 months in a row. We have a performance of 40 months, month after month, the unemployment rate coming down. And we can say very proudly that Colombia has created more jobs than any other country in Latin America, including Brazil, which has four times our population. Um, this is something which I think is extremely important because also the jobs that we've been creating for the first time are formal jobs instead of informal jobs. But not only that, we have put in place uh, specific focused public policies um, and taken action to fight poverty and extreme poverty. And uh, besides Peru, which has been the country that has performed better in this aspect. Uh, but after Peru, we are the best performer of the whole region in terms of uh, decreasing poverty. 
and also in the, against extreme poverty. We have also put in place specific actions and we have been able to take out of extreme poverty more than 1,300,000 Colombians. Uh, and not only that, one of the big problems that we had uh, that was one of the bottlenecks for our, our sustainability in the long run was how unequal the country was, the social injustice of the country. We were the s second most unequal country in the whole of Latin America after Haiti. This was something completely unacceptable to me and to all Colombians. And we uh, said we were going to break this trend, this perverse trend that we've had for so many years, whereby the economy grew, but also the inequality grew. The rich became richer, the poor became poorer. We put in place specific actions, we broke this trend, and we can also proudly say that in the last three years, uh, Colombia has lowered its inequality more than any other country except for Ecuador. Ecuador performed better than we did. But we are not any more than number two in the hemisphere. We're on, on the average. Of course, we still have tremendous inequalities. Of course, we have still almost two million people unemployed. Uh, and of course, we still have around 30% of the Colombians living in poverty. But the progress has been tremendous. And what I think hope is that if we reach a peace agreement, then we, we can concentrate <coughs> uh, even more of our resources in achieving a better uh, social, <coughs> uh, better social ind indicators and more progress uh, in, in that respect. Excuse me. Um, In our international relations, um, I also decided to, to change the way we were doing things. When I arrived uh, to the government, we were uh, in a bit of a bad shape in that respect. The free trade agreement in the US was blocked. The free trade agreement with Europe was blocked. We were on the verge of war with our neighbors, with Venezuela, with Ecuador. Um, and I said, we must change this. Uh, we have to be relevant uh, players in the world scenario if we want to have uh, a good internal uh, performance. And we decided to start ch changing the situation. The first thing I did after assuming power was uh, to call my, um, until then, uh, one of the worst enemies, which was Mr. Chavez. I invited him to come to Colombia. We sat down. Uh, one in front of each other, and I said, uh, listen, we've been at odds for a long time because as a journalist and also as a minister of...
upgrade more, more profoundly, and things are working quite well. It's, be, it's become the attraction for many investors and, and for the world, and we will continue with that, uh, with that uh, initiative and, and trying to integrate the whole, uh, the whole continent. Uh, therefore, I think we're, we're doing well on the economic side, we're doing well on the social uh, front, we're performing well on the international front, uh, but of course the, the cherry on the pie would be the peace process. If we are able to finish this peace process, uh, then I think the future for Colombia and for the region would be even much better. Uh, the, the question I put to the people is, if we have achieved those results in the middle of a conflict, um, just imagine what we could do without the conflict. I, what I say is the conflict is like a dead mule in the road. It, it, has, it has inhibited the Colombians uh, to realize our full potential. And we have a great potential. Colombia is very rich in almost everything. Not only are we the most, uh, the richest country in biodiversity per square kilometer in the world. We have the largest species of frogs or of uh, birds in the world, but we also have a tremendous uh, uh, human capital, and we now have a tremendous soccer team. Uh, we are now one of the best four teams in the world. So there is a lot of good future for Colombia. I try to um, to reiterate that uh, every day to, to my fellow Colombians and to the world. Uh, of course we have problems, of course we have challenges, of course there are still many problems that we, we, we don't fix a country that has been at war for 50 years in, in three years, but we, we're making progress. We're making progress and our relations with the U.S. also couldn't be better. Uh, I'm proud to say that we have good relations with both parties. Uh, we have very good relations with the Obama administration. The free trade agreement is working very well. Uh, both sides, this is a, has been a win-win situation. And uh, uh, we're now cooperating in things like education, technology. Uh, we are, we, for example, we are connecting every single municipality in Colombia with broadband and fiber optics. Uh, this is going to be the first country that's going to be completely connected in Latin America. How can we use that infrastructure, uh, the technology, to better combat poverty, to take to the very remote regions uh, the benefits of technology? This is, those are the type of challenges that uh, the U.S. could help us a lot. You have here the know-how. Uh, you have the universities, you have the software industries, uh, and there we can really create a lot of synergies. So um, I come here full of optimism and full of good, of good uh, intentions, uh, good intentions that are, being, are becoming realities. The facts are there. Um, I don't say it, it's the International Monetary Fund that says that Colombia is one of the best performing economies in the world. Um, the social uh, indicators, uh, I'm not saying it, it's the human uh, development uh, program of Oxford University who's saying that Colombia has a model that should be replicated worldwide, uh, but I'm proud that uh, this is happening in my country, and that's the success story I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Thank you. We have lots of questions on lots of topics. Uh, starting out, the U.S. has had to limit its military presence in South America due to sequestration and prioritizing the Pacific. How concerned are you about this, especially for drug interdiction? And is this something you talked about with President Obama today? Well, we, we uh, value extremely uh, the help that the U.S. has given us through Plan Colombia, it has been extremely useful. I say not 
because of the quantity, because when you add up what Plan Colombia has uh, given us versus what we have to we have had to invest ourselves, uh, it's it's a very small percentage. But the quality of that help, in terms of intelligence of uh, practical ways to be more effective in, for example, the fight against drug trafficking has been very, very useful. And that has, but that is a knowledge that we have already acquired. And as I mentioned, it's a knowledge that we're sharing with other countries. And in a way, what we're doing with the U.S. is lowering the cost and expanding uh, and uh, strengthening the results through, you would say, a proxy a, a procedure the, the, whereby Colombia is providing this help with the, the help of the U.S. and in that case uh, you could make the, the uh, resources much more efficient. Is the U.S. going in the right direction by evolving from security aid to economic development help, and uh, what more should the U.S. be doing? Well, I think, yes, it's going in the, direct, in the correct direction, uh, but it, they, should never, uh, they should never ignore that uh, the security is the basis for progress of any society. Uh, but uh, in the case of Colombia, if we, if we learn and we have been improving all our security indicators, uh, it makes a lot of sense to invest those resources where they have a better return, especially a better social return. So I think that is a, a wise uh, way to, to use the resources better. And that's what is happening in Colombia. We have made tremendous progress in security, and now we have to make more progress on the social agenda. And if the U.S. is willing to help, well, we more than welcome it. You talked about income inequality decreasing in Colombia. Of course, in the U.S., it's increasing. Did you offer President Obama any advice on that? <laughs> uh, no, I, I didn't. I, I, I forgot to tell him about it. <laughs> but um, we, 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 are, we are making a lot of progress there. Um, and uh, through, uh, through very effective uh, mechanisms. For example, we have a, a program whereby we have identified about 1.2 million families, and each family has one uh, one person who is the manager of that family. It has 45 different factors that has to have to be solved in order for that family to be graduate from extreme poverty. And we have 18 institutions of the state, of the government, uh, providing help in that process. And that has been extremely successful. And we've brought a lot of people out of extreme poverty uh, through, through mechanisms like this one. Uh, there are, I, I tell my people always to be, to innovate, innovate especially on the social uh, agenda and the social uh, policies. Because and people have many times great ideas on how to do that, and this is something that I think should be uh, shared with the other countries because it's working and and uh, what works should be copied. You mentioned the free trade agreement that was signed about a year and a half ago. Was there a discussion today with President Obama on how that's going and uh, whether anything should change with it? Yes, we. We came to the conclusion that the free trade agreement is working quite well. The U.S. Has, is exporting more to, to, to Colombia and vice versa. There are some specific issues where uh, we have mutual, uh, not complaints, but uh, mutual uh, efforts to, to uh, obstacles to overcome. Um, they mentioned something with the labor some some issues with the uh, with the labor situation in Colombia. We address those issues uh, very clearly on what we're doing there. Um, I wanted uh, the U.S. to be more helpful in uh, lifting 
obstacles uh, that would allow us, for example, to export our avocados to uh, the U.S. Because I was giving uh, in the White House a delicious uh, salad as a first plate in, in, the, in the lunch. And there was an avocado, but I said, this, must not, this is not a Colombian avocado because we have restrictions. We need those restrictions to be lifted. Those type of uh, items are the ones, or the, the subjects are the ones that we, uh, we uh, shared. Uh, but in, in general, we are very happy with the way the free trade agreement is going on, is, is performing. There's been concern about the protection of workers under the free trade agreement. Do you think that workers are being adequately protected? Uh, yes. We, we still have to go further. But the, the difference for the protection of workers in Colombia in the last uh, two or three years, uh, what it was then and what it, was, what it is now, is a major difference. Uh, again, I recognize that there, we have to go f further, but the progress is there and the facts demonstrate it. What's your take on the protests um, by farmers and other workers in rural areas? Um, how, to, to what do you uh, attribute the protests and what resolution do you see for the future? The, the rural areas have been neglected not for years, for decades, or even, or even for centuries. And that's where the poverty and the inequality is concentrated, much more than the urban areas. And uh, what happened there is uh, because of the uh, commodity crisis, for example, the price of coffee went down from $3 to $1 per, per pound in the international markets where the people, uh, with good reason, went out, out to protest. What are we doing to address this problem? As I mentioned, the peace process has one of the items, the first item, uh, this, uh, this uh, vision of a shared, a shared vision on how we can uh, give more importance to the rural areas. We are increasing the budget uh, to be invested in rural areas. This year we approved for next year uh, five billion pesos. Five billion pesos is a huge amount of money compared to what they received before the the rural sector. Uh, but more importantly, we are um, constructing a long-term policy for the r rural areas with the participation of everybody, uh, especially the peasants, uh, for them to be on the locomotive, not on the wagon. In this train that we think is going to be extremely uh, useful for Colombia and the world. The world is seeking more and more food, and Colombia is one of the few countries that can expand uh, in a short period of time the production of food. And so there we have an opportunity, and uh, that's what I'm trying to build uh, through different policies and different uh, discussions this overall uh, agrarian policy that will help the rural areas uh, to develop at a faster rate. If an agreement was reached two months ago, why are protests continuing? Sorry? W why are protests continuing if an agreement uh, has been achieved? S but very small. Some, uh, the coffee grow some coffee growers claim that uh, uh, the help has not arrived to their to their region, but this is a very marginal uh, uh, protest. Uh, if, you, if you analyze the, the, the protest that you are receiving today uh, compared to what the, we had some, some time ago, uh, is completely different from what was happening before. Do you think that conditions for Colombian farmers will truly improve only when a peace agreement is reached? Well, I, I hope they will improve, uh, not, with or without agreement. Uh, what I've said is we have a set of objectives that are not dependent on an agreement with the FARC. We need to invest in the rural areas regardless if there's an agreement or not. We need uh, to uh, take uh, public goods to the rural areas, roads, uh, 
schools, um, hospitals, regardless of there's, if there is an agreement with the FARC or not. Uh, and what I've said is we need to establish a, a policy that is shared by everybody, and uh, with that policy, we have to find the resources to uh, finance those projects. In your talks with President Obama today, did he give his support for the peace talks with FARC? Definitely, yes, and I appreciate that very much. He, he has been supporting the peace process. He was one of the first ones to know about the peace process when, when it was uh, a secret and nobody knew about them. I shared that secret with him uh, when he went to Colombia during the Cartagena summit. And uh, since then, not only him, the whole government has been extremely supportive of the peace process. Today, the FARC called for an international conference on illicit drugs to include the U.S. and Europe. What is your reaction to that request? Well, uh, the, the call for a, a discussion on what to do with the fight and the war against drugs uh, has been on the agenda for a long time. As a matter of fact, we put this on the agenda uh, in the Cartagena summit, uh, which uh, approved uh, a mandate to the OAS. I was discussing with the OAS today about this specific issue. Um, we made a big uh, exercise, uh, an analysis of different scenarios that would happen if we take different actions, these scenarios should be the, used as an input for a worldwide discussion on this issue. The question is, are we doing the best we can, or can we do something more effective? And uh, this is something that the world needs to discuss. Uh, we've been proposing it for a long time, and we've been receiving increasing the amount of support, uh, including the U.S., uh, because they approved the mandate to the OAS on this issue. And I think it's, it's useful and it's positive to uh, re-examine the whole issue of the war on drugs uh, because it's a multilateral world problem that affects everybody. You set a one-year time frame for the talks with the FARC, and we're, of course, closing in on that year, and you've... You've gotten to point three. Uh, how, how long are you willing to extend the time frame for those talks? When I mentioned a year, it was simply because last November, um, they asked me, how long would you like to have these talks? And I said, I would prefer that these talks uh, last months and not years. And so everybody started making the arithmetic, I say, well, months would be go to November or December of this year, which we are in right now. Um, of course, I would have liked for this to advance faster, but uh, I think that we have made uh, enough progress to maintain the optimism. Um, I don't know how long it will take to finish the agreement. I hope uh, it would not take too long, but it is completely counterproductive to put uh, on a process like this uh, fatal deadlines. And so I don't have a fatal deadline, uh, and I'm not putting a fatal deadline on the agenda. Is some sort of deadline important, or are you willing to continue indefinitely with no deadline at all? No. Uh, of course, nobody will uh, continue indefinitely. These processes uh, wear out. The support will wear out. Uh, I think we're all conscious of that. But uh, I prefer to say we hope to finish as soon as possible without putting a definite deadline because the experience in other processes when you put deadlines have been very counterproductive. A questioner asks you to describe the agreement on point two on political participation. Questioner asks what role will the FARC have in Colombia's democracy and have they been guaranteed political representation? Well, of course, what the process is all, about, is all about is for them to have a space in the democratic arena of, of Colombia. And uh, uh, by 
giving uh, certain guarantees that they will have this uh, space where they will then be stimulated to change their arms for votes and change their their uh, way of doing politics or trying to achieve what they want to achieve through violence and do it through legal means. And uh, the, the answer is yes, we have uh, given them the, the sufficient uh, conditions and guarantees for them to be able to participate in politics. That's what the process is all about. You mentioned that your talks are coming after 50 years of strife. It's not something new for your country. How do you tell us that your negotiations differ from previous peace talks, for example, under President Pestrana? Well, the conditions are completely different. The country is completely different. The military correlation of forces is completely different. The conditions that we put to start negotiations are completely different. Uh, during the Pastrana administration, um, they, they uh, cleared uh, an area which was the size of Switzerland for the FARC to be there. Uh, I decided and I said there would not be one centimeter of our territory cleared for them because we had a very bad experience with that, uh, with that example. Uh, I said we w there would be no ceasefire. I said uh, we will not, uh, we will negotiate under the principle of nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. Um, this has been a very well planned process compared to others that uh, were not as, as well planned and the results are there. You referred to your predecessor, who of course has been critical of, of your administration, especially in the dealing with FARC. Uh, can you please explain uh, your response to his criticism? No, I, I prefer to uh, dedicate my time to better things. <laughs> <laughs> well, why are the talks being held in Havana? Why was Cuba selected as the venue rather than, say, Panama or any other locale you could have chosen? Um, Cuba uh, gave our counterparts uh, more confidence. They are, they were extremely uh, worried about their, their own security. Uh, when I said we will not negotiate in Colombia, uh, Cuba seemed to be uh, a good place and the Cuban government uh, has been extremely helpful. And since the beginning they said we will help uh, to host these, uh, these meetings. And uh, I think that the correct decision. Questioner says, you know where the, um, <clears throat> where the FARC is in the jungle and where their bases are, and we have lots of oversight, surveillance, and intelligence on this topic. Why have you not just bombed them out of existence, and are you afraid of repercussions? Uh, we have been bombing them uh, quite frequently. Um, that's the truth. The thing is that they have learned how to hide and how to, uh, to uh, protect themselves from this intelligence. They're, they're, they learn very fast, but uh, believe me, we continue trying. Will the peace overtures you're making with the FARC make anti-drug efforts more difficult in the US or any other country? On the contrary, I think it, it would make it much easier. Again, can you imagine? The FARC that has been accused of being the biggest cartel in the world, now uh, in our side, uh, helping to substitute uh, coca plantations with other crops and, and helping us uh, identify the routes where drug traffickers uh, move their, their drugs, this would be a major achievement. Questioner says, Colombia's drugs mostly go through Mexico to get to the U.S. What are you doing to get Mexican cooperation to stop this flow? We have very close cooperation with, with Mexico. Uh, we've been even training many of their people in Colombia. Uh, we have a permanent uh, uh, real-time 
uh, information uh, uh, sharing. Uh, we have the two police uh, cooperate among themselves. Uh, there, is, there is a very strong and increasing cooperation with the two countries. Do you see a Colombia free of cocaine someday? Is that possible? Well, I dream about it, yes. And uh, um, if we reach an agreement, a good agreement on this issue, at least we can see uh, cocaine diminishing substantially in Colombia, which would be a great, great uh, achievement. Colombia has been the country that has suffered the most in this war on drugs in the world. We have lost our best politicians, our best policemen, our best judges, our best people. Has been uh, spilled in this war on drugs. Uh, and uh, we will continue because it's a matter for us of national security. Uh, so anything that will improve the situation uh, in our effort to eradicate drugs from Colombia would be extremely, extremely beneficial for the Colombian society. Looking to other um, concerns involving the U.S., has the National Security Agency's monitoring of private communications tainted diplomatic relations between Colombia and the U.S.? Well, we have been uh, sharing information uh, on security issues for a long time. Colombia is a very particular country in the sense that uh, we share with the U.S. and other intelligence agency uh, all the information and uh, therefore if we have spied on our common enemies, it, it, it has been done uh, with the cooperation of the Colombian authorities and the U.S. authorities. Now, I don't know of information of spying outside that uh, sphere of cooperation. If I knew about that, then uh, of course I would condemn it immediately. Some of your neighbors in Latin America, of course, have been infuriated by revelations of uh, U.S. eavesdropping. Is their anger justified? Well, nobody likes to be spied. And I think, uh, yes, uh, uh, no, if somebody uh, spies on you, um, you have all the right to get mad. And uh, so they have all the, right, all the right to get mad if they're spied without permission. Looking to China, uh, China's investment in Latin America, of course, continues to grow, and the country signed more than 50 bilateral cooperation agreements just last week. Can you tell us more about the Colombia-China economic relationship, and do you see any effects there that it may have on U.S.-Colombia economic relations? Um, we we uh, have a normal relation with China, good relation. Uh, our biggest uh, commercial partner is the U.S. Uh, the uh, trade with China has increased, but not dramatically. Um, and uh, of course, China is now a big player in the world economy. Um, I have been sharing with with uh, many of the persons I've been I've been uh, talking to a situation where I think it's, there's an opportunity for Latin America and the U.S. Uh, there's a, a, a new concept that is becoming a very important concept, uh, is the, the concept that is referred to as a demographic dividend. Um, the source of growth in the world um, that, was chi that, uh, that China was uh, some years ago, it's starting to diminish because the negative democratic, uh, demographic dividend that they are having because their population is not increasing. On the contrary, it's decreasing. You have that problem in Europe, and you're having that problem here in the U.S. One of the few areas in the world where you have a positive demographic dividend is Latin America, where you still have young population. And there, you have a tremendous opportunity if the U.S. sees Latin America with uh, those eyes, there's a 
tremendous opportunity to, to increase the cooperation between the two areas. And even you're going to use, you're going to need immigration sooner or later if you want your economy to continue growing. And that immigration will probably come naturally from Latin America that even has a political dividend here. So there is a tremendous opportunity uh, for the U.S. in Latin America. Uh, of course, China is always very interested in Latin America's uh, energy, energy resources, in our water, in our, in our biodiversity. Uh, and if they want to invest in, in Latin America, well, welcome. So be it. Thank you. We are almost out of time, but before asking one last question, just a couple of housekeeping matters to take care of. First of all, I'd like to remind you about our upcoming speakers. On December 10th, we have the Honorable Annis Parker, Mayor of Houston, Texas. On December 16th, Dan Ackerson, Chairman and CEO of General Motors. And on December 19th, Ricky Skaggs, Grammy Award winner and bluegrass legend. Second, I would like to present our guest today with the traditional National Press Club coffee mug, hopefully to be filled with Colombian coffee. <laughs> Thank you. And for the final question, you mentioned the good prospects of Colombia's national soccer team. The U.S. team is also looking up for a change. How do you see the prospects for our two countries uh, in the World Cup? Well, I, I told President Obama this morning that I wish that our teams would not meet in the first round because it would be uh, very disrespectful to eliminate the U.S. Uh, so fast. <laughs> <laughs> Diplomatic, thank you. <laughs> thank you, of course, for coming today. I'd Thanks. also like to thank the National Press Club staff, including the Journalism Institute and Broadcast Center, for helping organize today's event. Here's a reminder, you can find more information about the National Press Club on our website at www.press.org. And please remain seated for some closing remarks in Spanish by President Santos. Thank you. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. ¿Dónde va a ser? ¿Aquí ya? ¿Ya aquí? Bueno, eh, buenas tardes. Eh, quiero brevemente eh, explicarles e informarles sobre el día de hoy. Por la mañana... Tuvimos una reunión con la Junta Directiva del Diálogo Interamericano, una institución a la cual yo pertenecí durante muchos años. Luego tuvimos la visita a la Casa Blanca con el presidente Obama. Fue una visita muy productiva. Comenzó apoyando el proceso de paz en forma clara y contundente. Apoyo que yo le agradecí mucho. Es muy importante que el presidente del gobierno norteamericano, que Estados Unidos apoye este proceso. Eh, hablamos también sobre eh, los otros eh, puntos de, de nuestra agenda bilateral, eh, la ayuda que nos pueden dar, eh, por ejemplo, en materia de energía. Eh, aquí han desarrollado eh, energía y una tecnología de los hidrocarburos no convencionales, donde Colombia aparentemente tiene una gran potencial y necesitamos esa tecnología, sobre todo para proteger el medio ambiente en la explotación de ese tipo de hidrocarburos. Eh, hablamos también sobre la inmensa oportunidad que existía en la cooperación en tecnología. Colombia está haciendo un esfuerzo enorme para conectar todos los municipios. ¿Cómo vamos a usar esa infraestructura tecnológica? Es uno de los grandes eh, desafíos que tenemos y ahí Estados Unidos puede eh, ayudar muchísimo y eso como instrumento para luchar con más efectividad en contra de la pobreza y de la desigualdad, pues es algo que a nosotros nos entusiasma mucho y le entusiasma mucho también al presidente Obama, inclusive decidimos formar un grupo de trabajo específicamente para eh, estudiar las posibilidades de cooperar en ese frente. Eh, yo le 
le dije la oportunidad que existía en este momento de revivir el concepto de la Alianza para el Progreso que el presidente Kennedy llevó a América Latina eh, hace más de 50 años, que podría ser una alianza para la prosperidad y la paz, que podría tener unos ingredientes diferentes, porque es un mundo diferente, pero con oportunidades enormes. Quedamos de ver cómo podamos materializar esa iniciativa, que creo que puede ser una iniciativa muy productiva para, para todas las Américas. Eh, también eh, hablamos sobre la posibilidad de cooperar eh, de, en materia de educación y de seguir cooperando en algo que es, ha sido muy importante, los dos países trabajando juntos para darle más seguridad a la región, sobre todo en los países centroamericanos, eh, las islas del Caribe, ahí hemos hecho hasta el momento muchísimas operaciones conjuntas, Colombia ha entrenado más de 17 mil eh, oficiales o personal de, de Centroamérica del Caribe y quedamos de triplicar la actividad en ese frente el año entrante frente a lo que venimos haciendo este año. Eh, fue una visita muy, muy agradable, eh, los, los dos eh, coincidimos en que posiblemente nuestras relaciones eh, Estados Unidos-Colombia están en un momento ideal eh, de nuestra historia y que teníamos que seguir trabajando para mantener esta buena dinámica en las relaciones entre los dos países, el Tratado de Libre Comercio va funcionando bien, los dos países están ganando, los dos países están progresando y es una situación también muy diferente a la que teníamos anteriormente. La situación en Colombia es muy diferente y esta conversación entre iguales, eh, identificando los puntos donde estamos trabajando juntos y donde podemos trabajar juntos, eh, es eh, otra forma mucho más productiva de tener unas relaciones con Estados Unidos. También estuvimos en, luego en la, eh, en la OEA, allá recibimos el respaldo de todos los países de la OEA y del secretario general para el proceso de paz. La OEA ya ha, hace una presencia en Colombia a través de la misión que tiene eh, en Colombia para ayudar en el posconflicto y eso es algo para nosotros muy importante. Eh, les agradecimos el apoyo y el, y el soporte que nos han venido eh, ofreciendo. Eh, luego me fui a unas reuniones con los dos partidos, eh, tanto el republicano como el demócrata, eh, a través de sus líderes en la Cámara de Representantes, de Nancy Pelosi y un grupo de parlamentarios de representantes del Partido Demócrata. Tuvimos una reunión muy muy agradable, donde les contamos en qué estábamos, donde ellos nos expresaron sus, sus puntos de vista sobre el desarrollo de todas nuestras relaciones. Lo mismo hicimos con el eh, líder del Partido Republicano, con el Speaker Boehner y los más representativos de eh, la Cámara del, del Partido. Eh, yo les agradecí a los dos el apoyo que Colombia ha venido recibiendo. Eh, no solamente en el Acuerdo de Libre Comercio, sino en todo lo que nos han venido apoyando eh, desde que se lanzó el Plan Colombia. Si el Plan Colombia tuvo un éxito como el que ha tenido hasta ahora, que es posiblemente la iniciativa bipartidista más exitosa que se ha lanzado en Estados Unidos en los últimos tiempos, que eh, cerrar con broche de oro, con un proceso de paz, sería... El, el fin perfecto para ese proceso que hasta ahora ha sido tan exitoso, eh, eso lo entendieron perfectamente y eh, por eso también están muy entusiasmados en que este proceso de paz tenga eh, éxito. Eh, de manera que, eh, en resumen, ha sido un día muy productivo, que de aquí van a salir muchos beneficios para los colombianos, el apoyo de todos los sectores de Estados Unidos a Colombia es prácticamente unánime, no, no he encontrado ningún reclamo importante, ninguna crítica importante, eh, o sea, estamos en un mundo muy diferente al que estábamos hace unos años, donde aquí había hasta protestas 
en, en, en algunos sitios por la presencia eh, del de gobierno colombiano. Eso me satisface muchísimo y así tenemos que continuar eh, para que estas relaciones sean cada vez más fructíferas, tanto para Estados Unidos como para Colombia y América Latina. Muchas gracias.